Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to go over ways you can counter Blood Death Knight on ladder. I've got four decks to showcase for you as long as tips in those decks and explaining kind of why they do counter Blood Death Knight if played correctly. Now, before we do that, we actually need to understand the Blood Death Knight deck itself and what its weaknesses is, are and how we can exploit them. So it's a very good control deck. Um, but if you just like look through most of the cards, there's so many dedicated to just removing boards. Uh, it's very good at dealing with boards, uh, particularly Blood Boil. This is one of the cards that uh, really excel in the deck to counter aggro decks. But if you're playing a deck that doesn't go wide on board, Blood Boil is really not that strong of a card. Uh, and we're going to kind of just talk a little bit over some of the ways you can counter and what are the weaknesses of Blood Death Knight are. Well, one of the most exploitable weaknesses is that if they do not have corpses, they don't have a board clear until turn 8. Um, now, with the location largely taken away from most decks, this one still has it, but a lot of the decks you'd find on that have cut the card. It's actually a bit more difficult for Blood Death Knights to accumulate corpses for a corpse explosion so you can take advantage of that. Um, if you have a big power play to put a lot of big stats onto the board um, that you can do on like turn six, it's uh, really good to do so. You just kind of go all in at that point. Something like Blood Ball is not going to be effective enough if you've got like five fives or things like that on the board because you're just basically doing more damage than um, the opponent's healing. The thing you don't want to be doing as Blood Knife Fight is... Uh, Doing your big stat play into turn 7 or 8. 7, usually not great because you're not going to have enough to, to actually push for lethal. So it's kind of leaning to 8. And then turn 8, obviously, the Soul Stealer's going to be around a lot of the time to uh, punish you. So really, it's like turn 5 to 7 is the window you have if you're playing a deck that can do a big board push that you want to go for it. That's always... Uh, of course, not very reliable all the time. They might have a lot of corpses. You might not have a big board push available for your deck. Your deck might go too wide and then blood boil suddenly good. Things like that can happen. So maybe we'll look for more effective ways. Well, another weakness of Blood DK is that it doesn't have a great time closing out games. It has a lot of removal, but it doesn't really have a great finisher. Moral Grain is basically the one of choice, but this is very slow at killing your opponent. You have a lot of time for most decks, particularly if the deck runs any sort of life gain to uh, counteract that. And then everything else really is just kind of stuff that removes the board. And then we've got Patchwork, which can kind of disrupt uh, some late game patterns for it. But other than that, it's, it's very hard for this deck to actually kill you. Um, which we can exploit because it suddenly makes decks that are trying to play a combo uh, that's very effective, very strong because you have so much time, or decks that do hand disruption, also very uh, effective. Things like um, Secret Rogue, for instance, have ways to disrupt the opponent's hand, uh, or secrets that also disrupt the opponent's cards, uh, and that's very effective against the Blood DK because if you're not giving them targets for all their removals and you're just trying to target their higher value things with things like objection or shuffling them back into the deck well the the death knight's going to kind of run out of stuff that to do and you're just going to outvalue them and generally decks that have a lot of value in it um particularly discovered or generated value or repeated value will do really well against blood death knight because you can just out card them basically uh, because you just have the time to do so. Now, you might suffer a bit in your other matchups by doing that, but, you know, it's possible. All right, let's go on to first deck that counters Blood DK. We're going to look at Relic Demon Hunter. Now, why does this deck counter it? Well, it has a lot of, of value and a lot of explosive late game power and the potential for an OTK combo. All these things are very good against Blood DK. Now you're playing a 30 card deck versus a, a 40 card blood DK. So your average card quality is going to be a lot higher. You have a lot of card draw in the deck and you have a lot of big explosive turns. Some of which come down before 
Soul Steel is online. Now, all these things factor towards the deck being pretty good against it. If you can get a big Phantasm online before turn 8, they're going to often connect face with them, uh, and you'll do qu probably quite enough damage to uh, put the opponent into lethal range a lot of the time. Uh, but the main win con of the deck, whilst doing all the relic stuff, is the off-board damage that you get from Lady Steno plus Rowdy Fan. Um, this combo in itself is very, very good. Steno up to 6 attack. Got Predations, got all your cheap spells alongside that. Spam them all out together, kill your opponent. Uh, do an absurd amount of damage. That's uh, the kind of thing you want to be aiming towards, so... Try not to <laughs> tempo out the Senna if you can in this matchup. I will say this deck list isn't optimized for Blood DK. Immolation Aura is very weak in that matchup. Um, and replacing this with like Spectral Sight will probably boost your chances quite a lot. You might suffer a little bit against other aggro decks by cutting this card. Although, I mean, it's not insanely good. You, you can usually get by with just Unleash Fells against aggro, to be honest. Particularly if you replace this with card draw. Um, but the card draw just means you're not going to draw dead. Uh, and if you're running Fizzle on the deck as well, it's going to allow you to draw the photo uh, a lot quicker. And get all your relic stuff going. Without having those uh, hands where you just draw removal, removal, removal. And no relics and no card draw. And then you just sat there doing nothing. Another tip I can give you for this matchup is... The Dimensions. Really try your hardest not to play this without a vault. Um, again, it's like, so you don't actually run out of stuff. Um, it can be tempting to just jam this on turn 6, but really, if you've got any other play, even if it's slightly slower, um, just go for that if you don't have the vault and try and just give you a couple of turns to find the vault, because vault plus dimensions very often just uh, secures you for the rest of the game. And if you start playing the dimensions without the vault, uh, things can get tricky and you just like gas out against them, uh, potentially. If you do want to replace Immolation Aura, don't want to go for Spectral Sight, what's well, something you could also go for is playing an Outcast package, potentially. Um, Glaive Tar is a, a good card draw engine, and it's also a lot of face damage on the weapon, so you could probably slot this into the deck. Maybe make it a little slow against aggressive decks, but it's a whole lot of value um, against slower decks like Blood DK, and they're likely very, very good. Put this in the deck, and maybe also try uh, this card too. And then, of course, you also still have the Illidari Studies, um, and you have the Fail and the Forgotten to... Uh, the other outcast synergies as well. Overall, just like a good deck. It's not a new deck. I'm sure a lot of you know how to play it already. Uh, I'll move on to the next class now. All right, we have Secret Rogue up next. Now, this is just a deck I found on HS Replay. There might be better alternates available. I know Bunny Hopper likes to play with Secret Rogue decks, so if you're Interested in this archetype, I'd definitely recommend check checking out his YouTube and his Twitch and Twitter uh, for finding decks related to this one. Uh, I know he's been experimenting with a jackpot version of this deck as well. But outside of that, why does this deck beat Blood DK? Well, as we mentioned before, Blood DK is weak to hand disruption and getting outvalued, and this deck is kind of a master at doing that. You have secrets that you can cheat out with uh, Private Eye. Perjury can find like objections and things like that. Very, very good. But the big one is Shadow Jeweler Hanar. This is a really annoying card for a bluff Blood Death Knight. If you start playing Hanar alongside with Cheat Death to protect your Hanar if, they get, if it gets killed, and each turn just keeps spamming secrets, objections, counter spells, these sort of things. Um, the bloody DK can't really do too much. Um, the only thing with this strategy, you gotta just be careful about playing other minions. Um, if you've got Hanar and Cheat Death up, well, you probably don't want to be putting out a Ghoulish Alchemist on the same turn because the blood DK is gonna kill the Alchemist 
and cheat that death that to your hand and then kill the Hanar afterwards. But in general, just you want to be keeping the Hanar train going, keep a cheat death up. You can also discover um, the Hunter Secret. I don't remember the name of it. Look it up now. Uh, emergency maneuvers. This is also kind of like cheat death in terms of Hanar. So you're pretty likely with all your discovers to be able to pick up a copy of either of those again if you don't already have the cheat death up. Uh, and just keep going kind of infinite. You also could shadow step your Hanar if you don't find any of those and go again on another turn. Uh, that sort of thing. It's a very big... Uh, big factor in why this deck does beat the Blood DK. Now it's a little slow for other matchups going for the strategy, but that's why you've got the rest of the deck. But I will say, um, in specifically the Blood DK matchup, you want to be looking for this card and trying to make the most of it. But again, when you do play it, just be careful about playing other minions alongside it. Even um, careful on some of the secrets you take, because... I will warn you guys, and this has happened to me, I didn't realise it. Um, zombies actually does trigger um, cheat death and emergency manoeuvres. So like if the zombies activate and you have one of these other secrets, the bee's going to die. And the bee dies, it's going to trigger the, the other two secrets. So just be careful about picking this one. It look, it's, it's a good secret, but... Probably not while you're doing the Hanar stuff. Also, watch out for Wandering Monster. Um, it's going to summon a minion. They can kill the minion. Just uh, just be careful in that regard. You don't have to like keep Hanar forever, but the aim is to, <laughs> is to do it as long as possible. Anyway, um, outside of Hanar, this deck has the, the Grave Diggers. I said this, this deck's like not very weak to some of the removal spells from blood DK, like the blood board and stuff because you're not really aiming to go super wide on board or you're not really aiming for your board to necessarily just win you the game on the spot or you're done um most of the cards are just to to complement the main goal which is an R value and hand disruption and then like winning through like queen ashara colossals sometimes uh, tests for a big late game bomb and of course you have the Astalor. So there's all the, the big finishes available um, but you're not really weak to removal too much in the mid game because so much of your value doesn't come from onboard stuff. It just comes from uh, generation. So that's why it's very very good. Um, only thing I'd say is well, not the only thing I say, obviously, but one more thing I'll say is just uh, don't go too all in on Hanar. The Blood DK actually can generate a bit of tempo. You want to make sure you can actually remove stuff with like uh, bone spikes and things as well, or have an early curve. And also, you don't have to Hanar mega early in the game. Uh, it's not necessary. It costs a lot of mana to to get this going. Instead, you can occupy your early game with like the Ghoulish Alchemists. Um, the concoctors, that sort of thing. And it's actually a benefit because later on, like I said, you don't want to be playing other minions with the Hanar. So if you draw these cards while you're doing the Hanar stuff, they're kind of just dead in hand. So best to get them on the board early in the game and then go for this later on. But yeah, cool deck and very good against Blood Decay. You just need to know how to play it. And you kind of frustrate the opponent out of the game with the Hanar, honestly. You might see quite a few concedes after a couple of boards of Hanar come down. All right. So there were two, like, sort of uh, slower decks, or late game mid range decks, if you like. What about an aggro deck? Now, you wouldn't think an aggro deck actually does well against Blood TK normally, but actually, um, Undead Priest has a slight favorable against Blood DK, and we can see that even on this uh, win rate chart for the top the top one, Blood DK, is like a lot of green, and then there's one red, and it's Undead Priest. Uh, why is that? Well, it's kind of to do with the attack of the minions you put down. They're very high, 
And also, Blood Decay is not very well equipped to deal with Reborn on some of these minions. Um, if you Reborn any of these three drops, they actually have a pretty hard time dealing with it. Like, the best answer they have actually causes them to take a fair amount of face damage. Like Ripper, and then also like a Hero Power as well. Uh, you got to remember, you're playing a 30-card list aggro deck with many different 3-drops and a 30 list versus a 40 list which has 2 cards that are decent against these and it's not like it auto loses you the game if you have it like they do take the face have to take the face damage um and sometimes you get like some value out of this one too so this deck actually pretty decent against the uh, the two versions of Undead Priest, this one and the more Swarmy one, I will say this one is probably a bit better against Blood Decay than the Swarmy one because the Swarmy one is weaker to things like Blood Boil and generally has boards that are less uh, uh, sticky, less annoying to deal with. Like These three drops are generally just all very high... Um, value compared to the other deck where you're going to be drawing like things like two ones um stuff like that which are generally a lot easier to, for the blood decay to deal with but yeah if you want an aggro deck this is a kind of the one to do it um yeah just i don't think you have to do anything particularly crazy against blood decay to get an edge just know that cards like this are not very useful to keep in the mulligan you really want to be looking for under allies plus one of your three drops plus like bone callers afterwards, Balaseth, just the high value stuff that um, is very annoying for them to deal with. Also nice if you have Balaseth on board, you can just full commit into a board clear because you just don't care. If a board clear comes down, you just uh, throw this and get all the things back again. It's very, very good. Um, so yeah. Not too much to say, just I would say just lean more towards value. You don't want to keep things like the weapon, that sort of thing, even if there's a one drop. It just doesn't, doesn't really do much in the matchup. Um, and the last deck to show you is uh, unsurprisingly Tony Druid, which I think a lot of people know already counters Blood Decay. So why does this counter it? Well, you've got the combo, Jailer and Tony. You go Tony, steal the Blood Decay's deck, then you Jailer, destroy their deck, and then left kind of in a position where if they clear your board, they go into fatigue and run out of cards. If they don't clear their board, well, your board's going to kill them. So it's a kind of catch-22 situation for them. You can do... Cheeky things like silence your own Tony after doing that to swap back immediately um, if you aren't pushing enough face damage. This deck has a big weakness though, is that it's very weak to aggro decks. Uh, and there's plenty of them on ladder as well. Otherwise, why would pe people be playing Blood DK? Um, so a bit more risky to play this deck potentially than the other ones I've shown you. as The other ones actually kind of do okay against other de aggro decks. Um, but, I mean, this is a fun deck to play when you get the combo off. For aggro, you've got, like, the Mishmash Mosha Turn It More combo. Um, can sometimes be good. Sometimes a bit too slow. One thing for the Blood DK matchup, I would say, is you don't have to do the Jailer-Tony combo as soon as you get it. Um... Particularly if you've not got your Groovy Cats online. If you don't have your Groovy Cats online, it's kind of hard to finish off the Blood Decay if they have uh, a board clear. Um, even if they're in fatigue, it takes quite a while to actually kill them. And if you if you don't have uh, the Groovy Cats or the Free Spirits online, your opponent actually might be able to kill you faster than you can kill them, particularly if you don't have any other threats or anything left in your hand, so don't always have to insta do it as soon as you draw it, maybe it might be a better idea to just try and draw through your deck and get the other cards out first. Um, 
There's another variant of this deck, which I think has some merit. This is like the most popular list on the HS replay, probably the one you're more used to seeing. Um, but this list here, I think, has some benefits over the other one. Now, we're not running the Mishmash Mosha in the deck. We're also not running Jailer. Huh? No Jailer? Oh, it's actually in the ETC. What's in the ETC? Good question. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, but I like this list. Uh, it has some benefits over the other list. You're running Chitinous Plating, Astalor. This list is not running Astalor. Got two slots dedicated to Attorney at Moor, which is a really bad card outside of the Mishmash Masher combo. It really doesn't do much at all. Replacing that with uh, these cards is going to be a bit more beneficial against aggro decks, um, even without the Mishmash Mosh combo. Another benefit to this list, we are only running four cards that cost six or more. That means the Flower Child is going to be able to tutor these cards, and these cards are very strong together. Anubakan under King Zok alone, or the big one, Anubakan, double under King Zok, you're just making so many stats, and that's going to be really, really good against aggressive decks. So just reducing the number of big minions means you're going to get this combo way more often. Um, now if you just compare the two decks, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 uh, cards that cost 6 or more, and this one only has 4. So, yeah. Um, I like this, and, and we've taken the Jailer outside of this pool specifically because we don't want the, the Flower Child to draw it. Uh, we put in the ETC instead, because you kind of don't need the Jailer against most matchups. Um, it's in the ETC, because against Blood Decay you're generally going to have enough time to fetch it out of the ETC. Uh, what is in the ETC? Well, this HS Replay link didn't actually have <laughs> what was in the ETC, but I have selected Crypt Keeper, Armor Vendor, um, and Jada, of course. Now, you could change one of the two of these to target some specific matchup to give you an edge in it. Um, I would say you don't really want to put in, like, Theater. It's not like this is a bad card in ETC in general, it's just, like, not a good meta for Theater, so you're just not going to be picking him that often. The reason I like these is against Blood, you're going to pretty much be picking the Jailer and against other decks too. But these two cards give you a high tempo uh, option and defensive option from the ETC for aggro decks. So if you don't have any armor or you don't have a Chitinous playing or anything, uh, you just pick the armor vendor. One mana, gain four, pretty good. But if you do have armor, you can just pick Crypt Keeper and maybe Hero Power as well and get this down nice and cheap, uh, and it's just a really high tempo minion. So between them, you kind of cover most general purpose matchups if you have to play the ETC. Generally you're going to be doing other plays anyway. Uh, and then you've got the Jailer for if you need the Jailer combo. Um, other tips for this deck, just uh, Careful on the mulligan. Don't keep nourish in the mulligan. It's uh, a bit of a trap. 32% keeping in this one and even more in this one, I believe, are keeping it. 46%. It's, it's not worth keeping this card. Um, you really want to get early game minions down. Um, get your hero power juiced up and contest early boards. Seedsman's much better for ramping, it's going to draw you a Nourish. Uh, and one more thing is that you don't necessarily want to use the Nourish for ramping every time. You might want to use it for card draw. And if you've kept this card specifically in your opening hands to use it to ramp, well, you're not going to be able to draw an, a Nourish to use for card draw afterwards, uh, if you get what I mean. And then suddenly cards like this, when you draw later, just aren't going to be as good because you've already got your mana from ramping with the Nourish, and this is going to draw you like an Innovate or something, it's not going to be very useful, but if you imagine the reverse, where you, you play a Seedsman early, and then you draw into a Nourish later, well, there's a much more useful card to draw into, because you can draw three instead.
So generate limit your mulligan to keeping uh, these four green ones and keep innovate if you already have seedsman. This would be my advice. You can also consider keeping the flower child, particularly against blood decay, because you're not going to be pressured for your life total, so you just really want uh, the value. For the matchup in general, um, this deck, if you're playing this version, doesn't have uh, a turn anymore. So you're going to have to change how you play a little bit in the matchup. You're going to want to draw through your deck more. Um, the reason being, you're not going to be able to uh, silence your own Tony if you do the, the combo. So you, because of that, um, when you swap decks, you don't want to be giving your opponent lots of cards from your own deck afterwards, um, generally speaking. And you just, in general, I mean, you want to uh, draw a few deck anyway. So you have like your Astalor and things like that and, and all your Groovy Cats. So again, just don't do the combo super early. Um, so yeah, there the decks. You really want to beat Tony deck. Um, you can put in, sorry, if you really want to beat Blood DK, you can put in like a Fizzles Snapshot into this deck as well. Uh, potentially just for extra copies of Anubricans and things like that. So like if your opponent um, plays a theater or a patchwork, they, they, they're not going to auto win the game, that sort of thing. But yeah, let me know what you think, guys, if there's any other decks that you've tried that also beat Blood Decay. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. And let me know your thoughts on these decks that I've selected. Other than that, good luck uh, on ladder, and let me know if you have any questions uh, about the video. See you in the next one.